Well, hello, it's Larry. Uh, we had our program a couple weeks ago. We did an awful lot in a short time, so I wanted to put together a short video to compress some of those ideas and help you continue with the ones that really spoke to you and do something with them. So, um, without further ado, let me launch into this. You know, the program's titled Count on Me, and a big part of it is awareness of how you're showing up. You know, this was a catalyst for me when I saw that quote years ago that said 80% of success is showing up. And then here's a quote from Brené Brown. Sometimes the bravest, the most important thing you can do is just to show up. And it suddenly occurred to me that everybody shows up. <clears throat> the question isn't whether or not you're showing up, but how are you showing up? What impact does it have? And how would you like to show up? And so, you know, I've worked with some organizations that were better and more productive they had more fun. They enjoyed each other at work more when their boss was gone. Well, that's showing up in a way that's not very helpful. And then the opposite has been true. So a big part of this program is just taking time to reflect and contemplate, which several years ago, Steffi Allen and I were talking about this. And Steffi was concerned that uh, a lot of her clients were telling her they just didn't have time to reflect. And one of the side effects of not taking time to reflect is you're going to be doomed to repeating the same thing over and over again. And at some point, if what you're doing isn't working, then you're depending upon a crisis to smack you up the side of the head and get your attention. So reflection is simply being able to take that time and sit back and contemplate. It's like, well, wait a minute. How am I showing up? How do I want to show up? What impact would I like my presence to have? And I, I remember reading years ago, Tom Peters at one point, after years of doing his, his authoring, his publishing, his speaking all over the planet, he made a comment in his blog one time that one of the things he wished he would have done more is he would have uh, spent more time with people contemplating, thinking about contemplation and reflection. And he's mean, meaning, I don't think about people contemplating their navel, that type of meditation and contemplation, but contemplating what's the impact of my presence? <clears throat> what effect does it have on people when I show up? And so that's what a lot of this program is about. So the first thing is just that awareness that um, it, unless you're aware of something, you can't do anything about it. And if you're aware of something, you're not doing anything about it, it's not very helpful. So taking some time in your day or in your week to be able to just sit back and contemplate and find the time or the space or the environment to be able to do that just to continue to grow yourself and bring the best version of yourself forward. So I found this sign in Bali. Uh, it was on the outside of a retail business and I really liked the idea. Please take responsibility for the energy you are bringing into the space. Uh, and so we talked about that a little bit in the training. I'm very intentional in the morning when I do my morning meditation and contemplation. And I literally think myself forward throughout the day and I'm like, okay, what's the flow? What's the impact? What do I want to remember as I go through all the different activities of my day? And how do I stay in alignment with myself and my integrity and the highest version of myself? So I do that in the morning, kind of pre-paving the way for the day to show up. All right, so accountability, basically we had a conversation in the room about the difference between reacting and responding. Accountability to, mean, it, to me means basically your ability to respond and whether or not you're aware of it, <clears throat> your presence is making it a difference. It's having an effect on people. And so a lot of my early work and my inspiration came from this quote uh, from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Who you are, who you are, speak so loudly I cannot hear what you're saying. As I've worked more and more with communication, team building, leadership sort of things, one of the comments that really struck me in the last few years the most powerful and most frequently used medium of communication is your face. And that means without opening your mouth, without uttering a word, you're already having an impact on people. So that's again, part of the reflection is like, if you're responding, you take a second, contemplate, how do I want to respond to this versus being in an automatic reactionary mode. So authenticity, the most powerful tool a leader has is your example. And that's again where reflection comes in. To be nobody but yourself 
in a world that's doing its best night and day to make you like everybody else means to fight the hardest battle you've ever had to fight and to never stop fighting. Um, I heard that years ago and it continues to influence me. So be your authentic self. Nobody else is like you. Nobody else can do you. So a couple of things that we really spent some time with. One of them is the sphere of influence. And from a responding standpoint, when you look at the center of this sphere, at the ability to control things, and then you look at the outer sphere, the red zone, those are the things that you don't have the ability to influence. And then the thing that's related to this is the power of your focus and your influence. What are you paying attention to? Where are you focused? And are you focused in a way that's enriching, empowering, enlivening, and energizing for you, which would be the inner circle? Or are you focusing on things that are outside your control that are exhausting, draining, and stressful? And we get to choose. Um, and I've also felt over the years, as many times as I've done this, this has been one of the most popular and meaningful parts of a training program. But I've often felt like I could come back to the same group of people four months later and present the same model and remind them because the most of the world doesn't live this way. So it's up to you. If this speaks to you, hang out in that inner circle. And the more you hang out there, the more you expand and enrich your influence. So the less you hang out there, the more you increase the areas that you can't control. So a couple things, being proactive, focusing on the things you can influence, your attitude, your mindset, your ways of communication, your ways of listening, the more you increase your influence. Attitudes, what are your priorities? What do you read or watch? What stories are you telling? What kind of conversations are you having with people? Are you talking about things that are right or things that are wrong? And then the opposite is when you're focusing on things outside your control, you actually shrink your influence. So you look at politics and weather and other people's opinions and views and natural disasters and, and that sort of thing. So I put this one up here. This is a vi image I found uh, on the on Google. Left side, small circle in the middle. Right side, large circle on the outside. And so what I'd mentioned to you in the room is if you want any more ideas, just Google circle of concern and you'll come up with some ideas and models that would be helpful reminders for you. Now, I brought this short clip in, we talked about it, um, but it's the idea about being proactive and being in control of the things you can be in control of. And this is just a comment from John Cleese, so I'm gonna share this with you, think about it. We used to rather admire people who controlled their feelings and were able to uh, remain tolerant of other people without getting upset about them. You know, I wrote a couple of books on psychiatry with a fellow called Robin Skinner. And Robin said something which I think is very profound. He said, if you can't control your own emotions, then you have to start controlling other people's behavior. So the thing about people who can control their own emotions is they're not making demands on how other people behave. Do you see what I mean? So making demands, I'll say that before we move on here. If you're not in control of your emotions and your reactions, your responses, then what you do is you try to control people around you, meaning if you would change, I would feel better. And that, first of all, is not ever going to work. And second of all, if you want to feel better, feel better. That's the internal world. Okay, so the other thing we spend a lot of time on, the golden circle, uh, this is from Simon Sinek and his presentation, Start With Why. And I'm just going to put the essence up here that the what part is what people are clear about. You know, that's logical, tangible, measurable, it's easy to see. The how part is essentially what are the actions you take to fulfill your why? And the actions you take are uh, when you're in alignment, when you're purposeful, when you're working at your best. And so being able to find out what kind of things invite you to thrive. You know, for me, I'm always looking for principles. One of the things I share often is that idea from uh, Buckminster Fuller that the most valuable thing we can learn is to learn a generalizable principle. Because when you learn the principle, you take it with you everywhere you go. If I'm not working with principles, I don't work well with details. I don't want data and facts because it doesn't work for me. And plus, people have far more data and facts in their mind right now than they're able to apply. So if you can't use what you know, adding more to it isn't really helpful. And so the why part is that feeling... From a right brain, left brain standpoint, the left brain is the analytical, logical, calculating, fitting things in, decisive part. 
and that's the part of the brain people tend to use trying to figure out their why. That's a great way to figure out your what, but it's a terrible way to figure out your why because your why is a feeling. It's an emotion. It's an intangible feeling and desire, it, but it literally has a visceral effect when why you do what you do um, resonates and then that drives your how that produces your what. So I'm just going to summarize that now. And I know we talked about that. We set this path in motion, but it's a long journey. And the biggest secret when I work with this and find people that have found some fulfilling benefit from this is they've stopped thinking about it and they started feeling it. And all of a sudden this underlying why it's like the core that everything else is layered on. So when you know your why, then it also gives you clues for how you show up when you're at your best. What, what actions do you take? And then the result of that is what you do. You know, and I love this quote from, from Simon, uh, Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, I have a dream speech. It's not, I have a plan speech. And the ironic thing is when you listen to commentators, media, people, sports analysts, politicians, and so forth, they all have a plan, but you can feel underneath that plan whether or not it's in any way in alignment with you or if it's really based on fact or you get a sense of whether or not something actually matches your why and your purpose and your fulfillment. So, okay. Uh, the last thing, we didn't have a lot of time for this, but it's essentialism from Greg McCown, who studied success in Stanford. And one of the things he found was that people who were highly successful the first time they started a business were less successful the second time. And in his research, he found out that one of the reasons was that the first time people began a business, they were crystal clear on the three or four things that were essential, that we have to do these things well if we're going to be successful. But after they were successful once, then they got a little bit more, I don't want to use arrogant, but I don't know what other word to use at the moment. They got a little bit more overconfident and they said, okay, well, we can do these 10 things really well, which you can't. And so it's a famous comment from him. And I think it also uh, comes from other people that have done a lot of work with leadership. Um, if you're not disciplined in the pursuit of the essential, you'll be undisciplined in the pursuit of more. Now think about that. If you're not disciplined in the pursuit of the essential, when people have a very busy day, but they're not very productive, they're busy stomping ants, but they miss the elephant in the room that would really be essential for them to work with. So think about that. And the other analogy for that is it's America's garages. Somewhere around 40% of garages are so full of stuff, there's no room for a car. So we're really exceptional about collecting things, but we're not really exceptional about knowing what the essentials are. This is the course of a day. If I'm not crystal clear on my priorities and my purpose and responding to the world, this is the way life will treat you, will treat me. The world is yelling, dragging you by the hand. This is important. This is important. And you need to worry about this. And if you're not careful, then you try to address all those things. And the side effect is you just get fried. So that's what essentialism is for me, is being able to get into that priority. And that matches perfectly with the why. Okay, so focus, decide, stay true to your course, be true to yourself. And what do you do for a living? Um, I have not been working for quite a few years. I've been dealing with cancer. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. All right. Can I, can I ask you a question? How are you now? Uh, last time I checked, I had some cancer in my lungs, my spine, and my liver. Wow. So you're not okay? Uh, well, not in every way, no. You got a beautiful smile and a beautiful glow, yeah, and nobody would know. Thank you. It's important that uh, everyone knows I'm so much more than the bad things that yes. happen to me. I mean, your voice is so beautiful to listen to. It was beautiful all the way around. Your voice is stunning. Mm -hmm. It is. Absolutely stunning. And I, I totally agree with what Howie said, you know, about authenticity. There was something about that song after the way you just almost casually told us what you're going through and, uh, you know. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy.
Wow. Focus. Uh, yeah, I love that clip. I'll put a link in the uh, description below so you can watch that whole video and listen to the song. So summarize that, you know, we have a lot more power to choose and focus on the things that matter to us and on being in integrity with ourself and living a clear and purposeful life. And, you know, I realize that's been a big part of my work. I felt when I first started in this business that um, I had a lot of advice that just didn't resonate for me. And then I realized that what I wanted to do was focus on the people skills part of business. And in that process, I feel like I'm a giant post-it note just reminding people of things. And in that process, I feel like as a reminder, I'm just really helping human beings evolve and be more conscious, be more present, and have a more fulfilling experience. So what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, quote that really resonates with me. I use this frequently. Everybody dies. Not everyone will live. And that's a guiding principle for me. So be yourself. Be yourself. Everyone is already taken. Everyone else is already taken. So thank you so much. I hope this is helpful to you. Continue the journey and make yours a great life. Bye.